The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. When you look at all of the issues that we have going on in the Bronx, I mean, we obviously COVID and climate change, which of course is the, the most recent issue, but you've got to put housing right at the top. And there are many different angles uh, involved with housing and certainly the development of housing. We've had a, a, a number of questions about rezonings, some that have happened some that have not happened. And then the most recently, while we're recording this on Thursday, September 2nd, just yesterday, the first, uh, up in Albany, uh, they uh, extended the uh, moratorium on eviction. So we're gonna do as much of that as we can tonight. We've got three great guests who are experts in all of those items. Uh, so let's first say a good evening to Chris Walters, who's the Land Use Policy Coordinator for ANHD, which is the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Mr. Walters, nice to have you with us. Thank you, Gary, nice to be on. And um, Mr. Jordan Dubry, who uh, is a um, attorney, he's a, a Bronx Works attorney. He's an expert in what we call ERAP, which is Emergency Rental Assistance Program. And uh, that, of course, involves uh, the evictions. Uh, Mr. Dubry, nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, the legislator who uh, put forth in the assembly the first evictions moratorium legislation and then yesterday in Albany was there and I'm, we're going to find out how happy he is that they were able to extend uh, the moratorium legislation and that is Assemblyman Jeffrey Dinowitz. Assemblyman, nice to have you with us. I'm a little be back. Nice to have you. Uh, let's start with you, Mr. Walters. I, I, this um, uh, uh, a report that you put out, uh, it's called Not All Housing Units Are Created Equal. Um, you really analyzed rezonings and you categorized them into four different types. And then the conclusion, I'm gonna let you say what it is, is fascinating in terms of who really benefits from these rezonings. People uh, in the Jerome Avenue area, and that, that whole corridor from Yankee Stadium practically to Fordham Road, are going to want to hear specifically what you've been talking about and what you reported on. So the floor is yours, sir. Let's talk about and not all housing units are created equal. Great. Thanks, Gary. Um, yeah, so NHD is a, is a member organization. So we're made up of over 80 community-based organizations um, working to build affordable housing when they're right for affordable housing and thriving equitable neighborhoods uh, for all New Yorkers. And this report really sort of came out of the work of our members organizing against destructive rezonings in low-income communities of color. And so what we really wanted to do was put some numbers behind this debate of how and where can rezonings be used as an effective affordable housing tool. And then on the flip side of that, uh, where might they do more harm than good? And so, as you said, we, we looked at housing completed in the city since 2014, and we looked at it in rezoning areas and non-rezoning areas, looking at different rezoning types. So um, big neighborhood upzonings like the Jerome Avenue rezoning, um, smaller private rezonings, private development rezonings, and then smaller sites where the city where a city agency is rezoning, generally on public land. Um, and again, what we were interested in finding out there, especially, was the ratio of affordable to market rate housing that's been produced in these different types of rezoning areas. Uh, again, essentially trying to say what rezoning types in the aggregate have been more effective at producing a higher ratio of affordable housing than you see today, than you see without a rezoning. And we also then looked at that by neighborhood type based on race and income. So again, understanding that the impact of uh, the ratio of affordable to market rate is going to be different in different types of neighborhoods. And so you know, what we found when we crunched these numbers and looked at this is that 
neighborhood rezonings in low-income uh, BIPOC neighborhoods are more likely to produce a lower ratio of affordable housing than you see without a rezoning. How ironic. Um, How sorry. ironic. I mean, that the, the, the whole idea of the rezoning is to create affordable housing. And your report comes out and says, well, wait a minute, if you do it this way, it doesn't help. Right. And what we're essentially saying is that there are places. So when you look at that, when you look um, on the other, on the other hand, when you look at whiter and wealthier community districts, based on what's being produced there now, you, you see that neighborhood rezonings do have the potential to create more affordable housing, a higher ratio of affordable housing than is generally being produced today. So what we're essentially saying is that, you know, right now the city takes essentially a colorblind approach and says, uh, rezoning is a tool and, and neighborhood upzonings are a tool that can be applied uh, everywhere. And what we're saying is you need to take into consideration displacement risk, you need to take into consideration uh, racial equity and the racial demographics of neighborhoods. And there's a right way to use that tool in a certain type of neighborhood. And in a neighborhood like Jerome Avenue, for example, there might be other types of rezonings to pursue or even more other types of affordable housing tools to, to emphasize and really invest in uh, to achieve affordable housing without some of the negative effects that a neighborhood rezoning can, might Can work. you briefly explain why that um, kind of ironic, uh, ironic um, result happened? Like the whole idea of creating, um, you know, a, a rezoning and redeveloping a neighborhood like the, uh, you know, the Jerome neighborhood plan um, is to create affordable housing, yet you're saying it's self-defeating. Um, can you briefly just explain why that is? Yeah, and I'll, I'll use Jerome um, as the example there. So when um, you look at Jerome, you know, one, so undoubtedly in those community districts, there is a, a need for affordable housing. So we're certainly not saying you don't need to find ways to create more affordable housing there. But again, it's this question of uh, using a tool that's not going to lead to perhaps a net loss of affordable, that's not going to increase displacement risk, gentrification effects. The displacement, that's, that's the key? That's the germ? That is the key. And, and so when you look at Jerome, you actually, when you look at what's been produced there um, outside of, you know, what, what has been built there already, those are actually community districts where most housing that's being built is affordable. You're seeing a much higher ratio than citywide of affordable to market rate. When you compare that to the ratio that neighborhood rezonings have generally brought, when you sort of crunch the numbers, uh, they've brought about 17% affordable housing. Um, you know, when you look at all housing completed in neighborhood rezoning areas since 2014, about 17% of housing units completed have been affordable. So it's essentially saying, you know, why would you bring that tool to Jerome Avenue, which is already creating a high ratio of affordable housing and risk bringing in the potential for much more market rate, which does not serve residents there and, and is going to increase displacement risk, displacement effects. There are other types of neighborhoods to focus those types of neighborhood up zonings on. But for Jerome Avenue, a more targeted approach is likely the way to go or is the way to go. A more targeted that avoids displacement. I mean, is, that is avoids that, displacement that's and that's looking to maximum. So if you're going to use rezonings, um, you know, what we find when we look at our numbers, public rezoning. So when an agency is rezoning a site and generally giving it to a nonprofit developer for affordable housing, you know, that's where you really are maximizing a much higher ratio of affordable to market rate. Those are the only types of rezonings that uh, produced, you know, more than 50 percent affordable when when uh, when you when you look at the numbers or even private rezonings where um, where the community has more opportunity to organize and to get deeper affordability and broader affordability that really serves them, uh, but not neighborhood, not neighborhood up zones. And then to focus just on other tools like, you know, increased subsidy for, for mission-driven developers, uh, community land trusts, and, and things of that nature. Another um, rezoning that was attempted but was rejected by the home uh, council member uh, was the uh, Southern Boulevard rezoning. And uh, council member uh, Rafael Salamanca said, you're not going to do it unless we analyze the impact to uh, various ethnicities and also find out what the level of displacement is going to be. And then he followed that up. He's the chair of the Land Use Committee. He followed that up uh, with his uh, racial impact study legislation that did pass in the city council. Do you find that this is a tool that will help inform uh, rezonings and kind of new neighborhood looks uh, in the future in the city of New York? 
Yeah, exactly. I think that the, the racial impact uh, study legislation um, is a big victory and is a crucial step in moving the city away from its sort of race blind approach now. You know, right now it does not look at the demographics, the racial demographics of any of the neighborhoods they're looking to rezone. And so that's exactly the type of approach that we're advocating for. And I would say, you know, the racial impact statement came out of the work of our members and others who, again, were responding to these rezonings, this racialized displacement that we're talking about, and, and really saw the need for uh, a race equity centered approach, uh, not a race blind approach. And so I think that the council members assessment was was the same um, as what we're advocating for in the report. And I think uh, that then opens the door to to this approach that really does take that into consideration. I'm, I'm curious how this um, entire uh, dialogue uh, uh, impacts or uh, the assemblyman feels about it. And now I know I, I haven't studied all of the development in your area, but of course, on Broadway, Upper Broadway, um, there are uh, developments that are slated to be affordable. Um, those are not the same kinds of neighborhoods that um, Mr. Walters was talking about. Uh, you know, on Jerome Avenue. Um, just what are your thoughts and does what you heard kind of inform what you might recommend in even other parts of your district, like in Wakefield or other places? Well, the development in our district, and I think probably in most places, is looks to me it's pretty haphazard. You know, developer by a, by a piece of property, they're building a building, and that's pretty much what's happening. In my district, we have a number of buildings that have gone up. In fact, the other building just completed literally across the street from my house, behind my head, out the window. Um, and in the past several years, there have been five buildings that have come up within a half a block radius of where I live, uh, but it's uh, been going on all over the place. Gary, you know that near, near you in that area. Um, uh, one of the disturbing trends that's taking place is developers are buying up uh, single family or two family homes and where the zoning allows for it, they're replacing it with as large a building as the zoning would uh, provide for. And that's really, to, to me, I know we need housing, but to me, that's a diminution of quality of life, replacing private homes with big buildings. Other people disagree with me on that. I, I, like, I like trees. I like open space. Um, in addition, when development takes place in a large scale, it's not, it's, it, often it's not in a vacuum. Are they figuring out, do we need another school, for example, to uh, how, you know, how do the um, uh, infrastructure, sewage uh, lines and all that, how is everything affected? Uh, there's going to be an enormous development that's uh, proposed now and I suspect will, could move forward. Uh, it will take many years in the Wakefield section between so the Metro years. North uh, um, Harlem line and New Haven line. It's a large tract of land. I think it's like 1,200 units of housing. Um, I, I haven't seen a detailed plan, so I, have, I certainly haven't taken a position on it yet, but my sort of default mode is that I don't like overdevelopment, but we have to develop, we have to balance the need for additional housing, particularly affordable housing, with uh, I think the need to preserve some semblance of open space uh, in, in the Bronx. And it's not always easy to do both of those things. According to the numbers that I pulled out um, um, partially from uh, the ANHD report, since 2014, 19%, 19% of completed housing units citywide are affordable, 81% are market rate. Um, uh, Assemblyman, the, the projects you talked about, are, are, are there opportunities for affordable housing in those places or are they market rate housing? I, I think a lot of the housing going up, I think this, this Wakefield project, as an example, I, I believe there's going to be a very significant amount of affordable housing in it. You know, not, not so many years ago, recently, relatively, on Webster Avenue, opposite Woodlawn Cemetery, I think four buildings were built. One building, I think, f focused on uh, uh, homeless people or what hope presumably as formerly homeless people. One was for seniors. The others were also very affordable. There's different levels of affordability. There's a building just a few blocks from my office at the foot of Riverdale Avenue. And it's not a big building, but they got the 421A, you know, tax handout, you know, right. that the landlords get. Um, and in return, the landlord had to provide, I think, I, I think it was like 10 or 15% of the units, which amounted to probably two apartments yeah. to be, quote, affordable. But well, when you looked at what they, uh, what the rents of those affordable units are, 
uh, yeah, they're affordable to people who can afford them, but uh, not necessarily affordable to the people who need them. Let's let Mr. Walters um, uh, summarize this. What, what's the recommendation out of your report for the future? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, and one, we sort of touch on that question of deep affordability and true affordability, as opposed to, you know, as the assembly member said, the, the quote unquote affordable. Um, but again, you know, what, what we call for in the report is, is one, just trying to maximize public rezonings, you know, wherever, uh, wherever possible, where you're seeing that very high ratio of affordable to market rate housing. Uh, and then again, focusing uh, neighborhood up zonings, not in low income BIPOC communities, focusing them uh, more in whiter, wealthier communities where that's actually the best way to get more affordable housing than you're seeing today. And then approaching private rezonings on more of a case by case basis, you know, wherever they're, look, they're looking to increase that ratio of affordable housing uh, to what you're seeing today. And, and I would say lastly, just, you know, we see tools like the racial impact statement uh, and the idea of comprehensive planning as a way to help get us there. And actually as a way to touch on with comprehensive planning, some of what the assembly member was talking about to, um, to, uh, to address the sort of ad hoc nature of development and uh, instead to take to a more comprehensive look at, you know, where, where development is appropriate. I do want to move on so we can uh, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, a lot of it about uh, uh, the evictions, but I do appreciate um, this dialogue. It's very, very important. And maybe with a new city council, and we're really going to have um, the majority of council members replaced uh, by largely um, progressive um, thinkers, maybe they'll be able to take a new look. So thank you, Mr. Walters. Uh, so you, been, uh, you must be happy uh, the day after you were in Albany. Uh, your your bill um, to extend the moratorium was approved. Uh, let's see, um, it extends the small business commercial eviction moratorium all, all the way to uh, January 15th. Um, maybe more importantly, extends the COVID emergency eviction and foreclosure act protections through January 15th. Um, hard fought, um, how do you see it? Just give us a summary of that. It, it, it was very hard fought. I mean, as you know, I was the author and main sponsor first of the um, uh, the law we passed uh, in, in June of 2020, um, the housing, uh, the Safe Harbor Act, uh, but ultimately we decided we had to go much further than that. So at the end of December last year, we passed the eviction moratorium. We renewed it in May and we renewed it yesterday. I, I, I stood for four hours debating the bill and it was, it was a labor of love because I really truly believe that if we did not do that, there would be countless eviction cases brought by landlords and ultimately many people could be left potentially homeless and you know a, a lot of the republicans were complaining that oh well in may you said you know we this was supposed to be it and i said i said in may well we'll have to see what happens but we went on the two uh, assumptions in may or two hopes i guess um one is that the erap money would get out and unfortunately, uh, uh, OTDA and, and the contract of bungle that. Um, and two, that the pandemic would be better now than it was then. And it was improving. But right now, the number of hospitalizations and uh, intubations and ICUs and all that are almost as bad as they were the day we passed the extension on May 3rd. And so to me, it was very necessary that we do this. Uh, and it was it was very contentious. It, uh, the bill only I think we ended up with 81 votes, each 76. There were a bunch of upstate. There were a number of Democrats who also voted against it. But ultimately, the majority believed that we could save lives by uh, by keeping people at home, because ultimately this is a health bill as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, one, one question for you, and then I want to bring Mr. Dubree in, who really deals with a lot of tenants who you know um, uh, are affected by this, whichever way it goes. What about landlords? who say, well, wait a minute, I'm not getting any money. Uh, I, you, and then you're going to complain if I don't maintain my buildings. Um, what, what happens there? Is there a fund for them to get replaced? Um, you know, because uh, all the talk about development and the right kind of development is going nowhere if the landlords are all going out of business. There is funding uh, approaching $3 billion, in fact. It's, it's, I think the total that is being spent is two point. Eight five billion dollars. Most of it came from the federal government, and it's it's largely it's to pay the back rent of many of the tenants if they fall in the qualifications. Mostly people who are uh, eighty percent of AMI or under, but not exclusively. Uh, and it, it but the money doesn't go to the tenants. The tenants never touch the money. It goes to the landlord. So we try to 
get rid of the back debt, you know, the debt that the tenants have and make the landlords as whole as possible, particularly the small landlords. Uh, Mr. Dubree, let's uh, just talk about uh, who you talk to, what the uh, tenants are saying. The fear must have been remarkable. Give me a, a kind of an overview at Bronx Works and, uh, you know, your extensive housing support uh, programs. Um, what did you find? Uh, yes. So the, the eviction moratorium getting passed uh, yesterday was, was a, a big win for not just tenants, but I, I think for, for all of the people in New York. Um, it's gonna prevent a lot of unnecessary homelessness. Uh, it's gonna give more time for, for the funds to get out from ERAP um, that, that will actually go to landlords. It, it, it'll help tenants, it'll help landlords, it'll, it'll help everyone, the public writ large. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big thing and there isn't a national moratorium anymore. Uh, the CDC moratorium, is no longer. So New York is uh, unique in that um, we're going to be a lot better set up than a lot of states that don't have any moratorium at all anymore. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to go a long ways to prevent homelessness. It's going to go a long ways into, um, you know, making uh, tenants a little bit less afraid of, you know, am I going to be out on the street? Uh, but one, one tool that uh, is around um, right now is the emergency rental assistance program. And that goes a long way into um, helping pay back rental arrears up to 12 months of rental arrears, up to three months of future rent, and even up to 12 months of utility arrears. Uh, so, that's, so that's a big tool like uh, Assemblyman Denowitz was saying that money goes directly to the landlords um, if the tenants apply for it. Um, it's a very much a collaborative process. So uh, here at Bronx Works, we do a lot of application assistance for uh, ERAP applications. And so there's a role that tenants play. There's a role that landlords play. Um, both sides have to submit uh, various documents um, to OTDA, uh, the Office for Temporary and Disability Assistance. And then after uh, the application is submitted, after both the tenant and the landlord submit their documents. There's a review period done by uh, OTDA. And then if that application is approved, the money goes out to the landlord and pays off what, whatever uh, arrears were approved. By are, are, are tenants who have not been able to pay their rent, are they simply off the hook at this particular, like in, in other words, the landlords are gonna be paid, so I guess they won't complain. Um, and then along with that question, how do we get out of this so that even during these very difficult times from the pandemic point of view, uh, people will be able to sustain and feed their families and not have to be in this? Because it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Nobody wants to be in that situation. They'd rather be able to just pay their rent and keep working. So I'd like to find a way, you know, we always want to find a way out. So let's just start with, um, you know, are they off the hook, number one? And then number two, um, you know, what, what's the future? And I saw the assemblyman nodded, um, so we'll get his. Well, well, then they're not exactly off the hook. They're off the hook for the 12 months and the three months, but they may owe more than that. And ultimately, a landlord can get uh, a monetary judgment against the tenant, and the tenant will owe that money. It doesn't mean uh, that they're going to have to pay it right now, because the eviction moratorium means if they qualify for it, they have to fill out this hardship declaration form uh, and the landlord now, thanks to the Supreme Court ruling, has the right to contest that declaration. Uh, but the, uh, assuming the tenant uh, gets, you know, gets the, uh, uh, you know, th that the uh, declaration is accepted, um, they will be, they won't be able to be evicted uh, right now. So that's the key thing, keeping people at home in the midst of the pandemic. But they will eventually owe some money and, uh, I, I want to get yes. Mr. Dubri in, in here. And just, so what are you telling tenants now? And is the ERAP program the answer for many tenants who are still saying, you know what, I, I hear you. I heard what the assemblyman said. I'm still going to you know, owe money. Um, you know, how do we unravel this and get them to a point of sustainability? Sure. So I think that the ERAP program is the answer for a lot of folks. Um, so we have... Uh, it, it, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. So there are some folks that, you know, maybe they owe 
one month of rental arrears, or maybe they owe, you know, 10 months of rental arrears. And this will, you know, pay off their rental arrears. And uh, maybe they, you know, didn't have a job for a few months during COVID, or they got furloughed or, you know, lost income for whatever reason. And this, this is going to be the, the program that, that tides them over. Uh, maybe they got, they got a job, but they just, you know, they're, they're underwater a bit, but, you know, they'll be able to, to, to pay it in the future. But the, uh, there's other people that, you know, maybe they have more than 12 months of arrears. And so ERAP will address That's a lot of money. That's yeah, right. it, it is a lot of money. So, um, you know, ERAP will address the 12 months of past arrears, the three months of future arrears. And um, then, you know, once they get approved for ERAP, then they have to figure out, okay, how am I going to pay the rest of that money? And that can be... The, the general advice that you would give, and, and I'm going to just say, contact Bronx Works and, and ask, I mean, because at least at minimum, you can provide uh, sage advice for them. Yes. So my, my advice would be, you absolutely want to apply for ERAP. Make that, make that your first thing. Um, Bronx Works is helping out with ERAP applications. We actually have a hotline um, that uh, we're, we're in a consortium with a few other uh, organizations in the Bronx. But if you call... You, Paul, we're, we're almost out of time. Can you call out the number? Um, 844-380-9169. Or there's also a website, exran.org. That, that, that sounds great. Assemblyman, um, take about 30 seconds. What happens after January 15th? You're going back to the legislature and say more extensions? Well, we hope it won't be necessary, but let me tell you, the only way to solve this crisis ultimately is if the pandemic subsides. And the only way that's going to happen is that people who refuse to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. That's the only way the numbers are gonna go down. And uh, so then uh, let's let Mr. Walters go all the way back around and uh, wrap this up. When you hear this dialogue about people living on the edge and you see your report, um, maybe you can just summarize what the city needs to do. I mean, we're, 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 I got the number here. Mayor uh, de Blasio promised um, a, a certain amount of um, uh, affordable. Let's see, he pledged to uh, make neighborhoods stronger and more affordable. I don't think uh, anybody would agree that that's really been done in a, a, a broad way. What do you recommend? You got about a minute, maybe not even to get sure. there. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, well, I think it gets to your sort of broader question of what is what needs to change moving forward? And so, you know, one systemic change needs to be, right, what are these land use actions that are exacerbating displacement effects, ultimately making it harder for folks to be able to pay their rent? And when that happens, uh, you see evictions. And again, we really see this as a racial justice issue. We've done a lot of analysis on evictions. And actually, when you look at it, um, eight of the 10 zip codes with the highest rates of eviction at the moment are over 80% uh, residents of color. So. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a crisis that's really hitting uh, our black and brown New Yorkers right. the most and we're, also we're, neighborhoods that have been most affected by by COVID. Well, uh, we, so, again, you know, appro approaching land use in a different way run. that I'm, takes that in, into consideration. OK, I'm so sorry to cut you off. We got to run. Believe me, we could talk about this for a long time. Uh, Chris Walters from ANHD. Thank you so much. Uh, Jordan Dubree from uh, Bronx Works. Thank you. And as always, thank uh, Assemblyman uh, Jeff Dinowitz for joining us. And uh, next week, we'll do more. Whatever's going on in the Bronx, open up your window. That's what we'll talk about on Bronx Talk. Good night. Mm -hmm.